Okay. Hi everyone, and welcome again to my audiovisual channel. Today, I bring you episode number nine of a conversation about art, during which I look for the meaning and purpose of both art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I will have this conversation with Sofia Kayafas, an artist I consider very well-rounded because whether she draws, paints, or sculpts, she always kills it. <laughs> Today, Sophia, uh, Sophia and I are both graduates from the New York Academy of Art, and seeing a gigantic, smiling self-portrait of hers was one of the things which inspired me to attempt making bigger drawings. I don't know if I ever told you that, uh, Sophia, but it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's a thing. And, well, thank you so very much for your time. And why don't you tell our watchers and listeners who you are and what you do? Wow, thank you. What a wonderful introduction. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, hello, everyone. Yeah, my name's Sophia. I am a painter, a musician. I think I'm a sculptor sometimes, and I'm always a draftsman. <laughs> That's what I um, like. I really, really love to draw. So me and Gabriela have that in common. Um, what, you want to know something else about me? Like what I'm doing with my life right now kind of thing? Yeah, just... Uh, yeah, what what would you say you, you... You, you... I don't know, do and, you know, maybe like a overview type thing of what your work is in general about? Or are you just your work in general? Okay. Um... I I think I'm making some paintings and drawings right now that talk about my spiritual life. Okay. Um, I'm Greek Orthodox Christian, and <laughs> I really love my faith. I think it's um, a really rich, deep way of thinking about my life. And it was a gift in, in many ways and also a burden in many ways. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, as a Christian person, I was baptized as a little baby. Mm -hmm. And I think that we all have two baptisms in our life. I think if you're baptized as a child, you don't really have any awareness of that. Right. But you grow up in the church and you, you start to realize that these beautiful things and the incense and the icons and the sounds and the songs and all of the love that you're getting is it, it it's equal to empathy it's it it means christ mm -hmm. and um in doing that in maturing in that way you, you have a kind of choice to make and you have to kind of own your baptism in a way mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think everybody has faced that that i know that's a christian on some level and i feel like that's where i am with my work right now so it's talking about taking ownership of that and what does that mean in my life all the complexity and all of the contradictions that i bring to that mm -hmm. and it's helped me work through all of those things um and i don't think that you need to know anything about christianity to appreciate my work <laughs> um hopefully it's <laughs> it's a little larger scope than that but um it's just i need i need to make it that's that's yeah. kind of where i am with it yeah, that's and that's that's actually another reason for which uh, I wanted to talk to you on uh, about the subject of art and beauty. Uh, so, excellent. Thank you for for you know uh, talking about it. I uh, I will definitely ask further uh, as we had, uh, go in more into the conversation. So, all right. So to start, um, on what occasions do you use painting, drawing, and sculpture? So, uh, meaning, why do you choose painting for something? Why do you choose drawing for something else? And why do you choose sculpture for something else? Okay, this is so funny being on the other side of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel so like, it's like silly. Okay, no I have an answer. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so I think most naturally as a drafts person, I think in graphite, I think in charcoal, I like to think to draw and draw to think and it's very natural for me. I feel like I've developed my own language with drawing that I don't really have to think. I can say complex things with the language of drawing. And even though they can be quite literal sometimes, it's I can get the job done. 
there's not I'm not having a complex about what it looks like you know I can mm -hmm. I can draw like a construction worker <laughs> yes uh, when I need to and I think in that way it helps um, meld the other parts of my practice together so you know painting um, this spiritual realm that I've been working on has been um, a slow kind of realization that that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm supposed to be making. That's what I want to make. But I didn't know how to, what that place looked like. So I started drawing it and it mm -hmm. just came very natural. So these, a lot of charcoal drawings, 18 by 24, thinking about, you know, what does this, this place look like? What is, what kind of, what are the different horizon lines and what, how do the mountains look and, you know, just it just makes it so immediate um and that's kind of been like the base for what i've been doing these days it's like i made like a hundred drawings of different um places and moments um in this realm whatever it is and then i was like maybe i can paint now you know yeah. i have a lot of trouble painting it's a really complex language you know i don't know if i really have my own language in many ways i feel like drawing is like speaking English mm -hmm. and painting is like speaking Greek. Like uh -huh. I can tell what people are saying, but, and I can speak a little bit conversational, but I can't tell you a story in depth. Yeah, in Greek. Yeah. You know, it's like, whoa. Um, so then I went to sculpture um, from the drawings. I went into sculpture. I was like, well, you know, what do these forms really look like if I had to nuance them? Um, and it's not just about the landscape or atmosphere or the light. What, what does this body look like? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then that kind of really helped me. I started playing with this figure that I kept coming back to, this woman with long hair. Maybe it's me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and playing with her posture and, you know, playing with different ways to finish her her anatomy, basically. Like, what is that? How in-depth do I want to go? And honestly... I want to use all the knowledge I have. Um, so yeah, yeah. doing a lot of stuff from imagination um, in both of those areas. And when it comes to painting, that's when I start putting in a lot, getting a, gathering a lot of references and the sculptures I've made is one of them. The form sense that I gained is one of them. Um, the contrast and the way of like breaking down and building up um, with the drawings, that's in the paintings. Um, and then I'm gathering references of other painters that have painted things that I like and photo references, you know, I'm, it's all coming together in the paintings and that's kind of where I am right now. The paintings are, I'm still trying to figure out how to have fun while I'm doing that. But for now, drawing is like very, very natural to me. So would you, do you think, do you think that the, um difference of how drawing feels versus painting is rather a matter of familiarity like I mean that's the impression that I get that you are just really much more familiar with drawing and so like now you have you might have to work more on becoming familiar with painting yeah and and and, and also what do you think do you think the the incorporation of color is what makes painting more complicated for you or it's like the difference in the mark that a brush brings and like the addition of the paste of the paint, for example, like I wonder what do you think, besides the lack of familiarity, like what, what is in your opinion, what makes painting, what it makes it more complicated for you for now? Yeah, um, well, I think drawing with charcoal specifically is like the closest thing that you can get to painting with a dry medium. Mm -hmm it acts so much like paint. You can just take a big chunk of charcoal and wipe it across the paper. It's like a brush mark. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's very quick, you know, and it's very loose and it's very fragile. So it's un it's an unstable material. And in that way, it kind of parallels painting very well. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. You can wipe and take away, you can add and take away, you can go, you can, carve things out with an eraser um in that way I, I really relate to it in that way because it it's kind of hovering in this space this fragile unstable space 
Um, and you can play with um, illusion, of course, but you can think a few steps ahead. So you can develop a really nice shorthand in charcoal that mimics a, a painterly approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, why do you say it's fragile? Um, uh, what, 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 what about it is fragile? Like both, uh, because you said both charcoal and painting, there's something you were referring to as fragile, like with the marks. I mean, what, 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 it, what is fragile about them and, and why? I'm talking about the material itself, uh -huh. Uh -huh. not the marks. I think when you put a mark down in charcoal, you got to mean it because yeah, it's very yeah. dark. It's, you, you can really actually nail things in, and that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. But you have to kind of play with the material um, in awareness that you can wipe it off just so easily. You can just accidentally wipe your hand across a charcoal uh, Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. gone. Yeah, yeah. Um, and painting is like that because it's liquid. It's mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. it's um, has this oily, pasty, juicy quality um, that's hard to control. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you don't embrace the chaos, um, I think there's a there's a there's something that that medium demands that you embrace the chaos in order to ride. Like you have to ride the wave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The medium itself. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, is that... Is that does, yeah, especially when you... I just... I uh, Something that you were just saying... Uh, you were saying just now about paint. And it's actually... Uh, I often like to playfully dig at painting. But there's something that I really like about painting. And, um, and it really... I think specifically with oil paints. And that it's... Uh, and it's that it reminds me of buttercream. Yeah. Or, you know, icing. <laughs> Uh, and I really like that about it yeah. uh, because it has because like you know I, I really like to eat and I like food and I like to make food and everything and so like now so like even that um, relationship even if only in appearance to food and dessert no less uh, it just really it's just like a really positive association for me even if I generally otherwise don't really care about painting um, but yeah, it's uh, I I completely agree with the also with the chaotic aspect that you're saying because that um, it, you know oil paint can be unruly you know mm. um, in that I mean I, I wouldn't know how to describe why I think it's unruly I just I get a feeling that it's unruly and you have to and like what you're saying you have you have to you know whomever chooses to paint has to be willing to deal with that basically yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Functioning on that cool. edge, that edge of like completely losing it all. Yeah. And being <laughs> comfortable, like basically like an elephant on a tightrope kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I think there is something to be said, especially now more than ever, I think with contemporary art and like Instagram culture, it's, it's so easy for us to overlook a relationship with the medium. Mm. because you read it everything's so flat it's like you read everything like a stop sign yeah um especially things oftentimes that do well on instagram i don't know <laughs> it's just like it's just shapes it's shapes with detail inside mm -hmm. and you think that if you get that detail then you've told this whole story but there's a whole other story in the the technical narrative, which Desiderio loves to talk about, I'm obsessed mm -hmm. with an artist's relationship with the medium. Yeah. And I really think any art that's persuasive to me, you know, and I'm pretty critical, <laughs> almost too, too critical of myself, honestly. Um, there has to be a persuasive argument that, that you have a relationship to the material and you're listening to the material. Mm -hmm. You're not mm -hmm. just using it to make this thing look real. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you ha obviously ha you have this quality because you fucking love your material and there's no yeah. doubt about that. And you, <laughs> you can just feel it. it. There's a fizzle. There's a, there's a uh, deep and rich story that even if I zoomed in and I couldn't see anything that you, what you've described, I don't even, I don't know if it's a shoulder or a lip or anything. I can tell that there's a fucking like epic narrative inside of the way you applied the graphite or charcoal whatever it may be 
there's something to that. You can't fake it. You can't fake that ability to listen to the medium. And I just, I wish everyone, everybody knew that that's a way, like if you don't think like that, I think it's like cutting yourself off at the knees and like walking around on stumps. Yeah. And you, a lot of people don't know. They don't even know that that's a thing. Like, I don't know. Maybe that's because I was given the gift of seeing a lot of great images because I, you know, I went and studied art. <laughs> yes. No, no. You're, yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And I mean, the, the, the added or not the added, like the new variable of Instagram and everything that comes with it is like, you know, we're, we're all like participating in it. Uh, and at the same time, we're kind of like expectant in a way to see how it's going to affect us in the long term. Not just, uh, you know, us that are living with it now, but just like humanity in general in the future, like what kind of reper repercussions <clears throat> it's going to have on us, like psychologically, uh, you know, on art, on just whatever it is in general. But that's going to have to be a whole ass other conversation because, you know, it, uh, it's a... I mean, it, it's it's a very complex variable uh, because it affects, because of what I was just saying, it affects us um, how, you know, socially, psychologically, how we present ourselves and, you know, us like in, in our case, for example, as artists, uh, I don't know exactly how it has affected you, but it had, it, it definitely did uh, affect me in a way that I consider negative in terms of my relationship with my work or just my work or whatever it is. And I'm slowly cleaning that relationship out, but, uh, like, well, um, that I want that, I would rather that was another conversation and let's get to the heart of this podcast now uh and uh why don't you tell me what is art in your opinion art yes well i had in my undergrad when i was going to school i had this teacher who would never tell me what art was uh-huh and i'm so grateful that he never did because okay. i think it gave me a really open mind about what it can be um I think everyone can approach it from their own way. I think that we all have to make it. Um, and some, we got to edit this. I was really <laughs> grateful that my teacher never told me what art was because it gave me an open approach to making things and seeing things that I didn't make, um, no matter where someone was coming from. Mm -hmm. I could take it seriously and think about it. Um, but when I think about what is art, it makes me think about art history, which makes me think about this, this idea that um, art history is the story of human consciousness recording itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you think about it like that, everything we make is fucking like, sorry, am I allowed to cuss on this? Yeah, do it. Swear as much as you want. Invent new swears. Okay. Yeah, I think everything we make is really, really incredible. If you look at it through that lens, just that human beings are making things, whether it's a pillowcase or a plant pot yeah. or a cup. Like, it's incredible. Um, but the things that we make reveal to us who we are. Yeah. This, is this, Apollo, this Apollo 11 moon landing, the BBC podcast called 13 Minutes to the Moon. Mm -hmm. And they talk about the moon landing and we get to the moon and what do we see? After we do this insane thing, you know, if I had to name three words to describe the moon landing, unnecessary, <laughs> insane, you yeah. know? And a miracle, some yeah. level of miracles happening. I mean, it's insane. Yeah, absolutely. And what do they see when they get there? They see the earth. You see themselves. I think that's really amazing. And I think that's what a good painting does or a good, mm. a good drawing does. It's a good anything. Um, it's like a persuasive, there's something you can't, when you behold this this image, whatever it is, or a sculpture, whatever it is, you're like, wow, this is who I am. And this is who we are. You know, you just get a big scope view of things through it. And I think that's why some images, they, they're true over and over and over and over again, 
for years and years and years, hundreds of years, yeah. maybe thousands, thousands. of years. Um, they're true. And I think, I think that is beautiful. I think that, I don't know, there's something about that that defines art for me. I don't know, maybe that's a very huge answer, but. But really good too. <laughs> Um, all right. That was awesome. And, um, I really like the, um, what you said about when they got to the moon and then they saw the earth. Um, because I kind of think that's, you know, you could argue that the fact that we even got there to begin with is kind of a miracle, but I think the observation of the Earth, being able to see it that way... Yeah. Um, that's, that's kind of a miracle, too. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to talk too much about it because I think I might start crying. Um, <laughs> you know, if I keep talking about it, because um, seeing it that small... Anyway, yeah. um, why don't you, <laughs> why don't you now tell me, I'll, I'll talk about it another time, and then when we're not being filmed and recorded for other people to watch, then I'll cry in front of you, okay? <laughs> um, now, yeah. now why don't you, uh, <laughs> because you kind of use a related term, why don't you tell me what is beauty in your opinion? Oh my gosh, this is a huge question. <laughs> um... Yeah, but you deal in these subjects. Yeah. Um, I think every artist is dealing with these subjects on some level, whether they want to admit it or not. But I had a cousin who talked about beauty in the past with me in relationship to orthodoxy, how we describe our faith. Mm -hmm. And there's something about the geographical location of where Christianity began and it's kind of in this place in the earth where it's not quite the west and it's not quite the east mm -hmm. and orthodox has retained that um, because the west becomes more truth oriented if you're looking at it through like a religious worldview mm -hmm. it's very like very catholic you know <laughs> in terms of Christianity so it's like how many angels are on the head of a needle and <laughs> it becomes very guilt oriented they're trying to be this is the truth this is the and it's like so intense and then yeah. the other side is, is the eastern side is very beautiful there's like there's almost no structure it's like it's it's be one with the earth be one with life find mm -hmm. i mean think of buddhism you know it's so beautiful you're like trying to remove yourself from your own way of thinking um my point is you might have to edit this too there's, like there's no this, editing here, Sophia. Oh, shit. There's so, this you know. overlap of beauty, beauty and truth. And so we're always think he's always thinking about that and goodness. So if something is is from God, it's most, it's beautiful, it's true, and it's good. It has to be those two things. If it's missing one, you should think about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know. Um, anyway, when I think of beauty, I think of of care over time like someone taking care over a long period of time over mm -hmm. and over and over again you could think about it like the repetition of prayer you could think about it like mowing the lawn you could think about it like the practice that you have with your art um there's mm -hmm. some care that you're taking in some certain ways over time becomes refined. It's a ritual in many ways. Mm -hmm. and that's where tradition comes from. Um, at least in the church, you know, why do you light a candle when you go in there? Why do you wear a head covering, mm -hmm. if at all? Why do you cross yourself? You know, what is what is the point of that? Why did you why did you learn how to do that? It's been being being done over and over and over again for over huge groups of people. Over, mm -hmm thousands of years um so i think tradition in many ways is a kind of caring over time so also a kind of beauty right yeah there is something beautiful about that um i think reverence comes with that word i think quality goes with that word i think um 
Yeah, I don't know. So beauty to me is... And that's just like, I don't know. I'm thinking about beauty. What do I find beautiful? I think the most beautiful things I have ever seen or encountered were moments where I've shared something with another person. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's through art, but it could just be in a conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It could be a film that I watched. It could be an animal that I am appreciating. These beautiful, overwhelming moments where you forget yourself. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Overwhelming. Um, yeah. You forget yourself inside of this larger thing. And when you, when you see what that larger thing is, you see yourself in it as well. Again, see it again. Um, Like, I might find a person attractive. I think they're beautiful. But, I, and there's a certain something to that. I think if, I think Christianity always makes a big deal about of the internal beauty, spiritual beauty. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something to be said for that as well. Um, like this idea of grace, you know, what is grace? Mm -hmm. They say like the Holy Spirit can't go inside of something unless, because the Holy Spirit's always trying to get in, right? Mm -hmm. It's always like not, Christ is always knocking. There's this beautiful icon I saw, I have to send it to you. It's just this small little, t this little meek little Christ and he's just knocking on this black door. And he's just so caringly knocking and it's it's our heart. He's always there knocking. But you but if we aren't actually listening that he's even knocking, if we can't calm ourselves to, to realize that, we can't let it in and, and grace can't go in there. Whether it's Christ or whatever, whatever you call it, it, it can't go in. And so it has to there has to be an opening for grace to enter. It can't just like go in whenever it wants. So I think there's a beauty to that. And I think a painting is a reservoir for grace on some level. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like you poured your soul into this thing and it's existing on inside of this container and we get to kind of look inside, you know, I don't know. There's something revealing about that. I don't know. Cause you can tell a lot from an image. I think it's the closest thing we have to telepathy. I think that we should slow down on that whole thing. <laughs> Go back to the paintings. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Drawings. <laughs> <laughs> the um the image you were describing. I mean, it's a uh, when you say it's an icon, it's like a tiny. In this case, it's like a statue. It's like a little statue. It's a little painting. It's an icon. Um, I can show. I have an icon here. This one. Mm -hmm. But you painted that, right? I didn't paint it. I just got it actually at church, but. It's just, it's a, in that style. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, the one that you described of Christ uh, carefully knocking on the door, um, mm. that really, um, it reminds me of um, what other people that I've talked to before have mentioned when I have asked them about beauty as well. And uh, a couple of times it's been mentioned, or insinuated at least, that it requires some willingness or participation or knowing something of that sort, some kind of knowledge on part of the receiver, kind of, in the sense that if you're looking at a painting, you can either walk by it or you can stop and observe it and, you know, wonder about it and just generally think about it, contemplate it. So, like, that is participating in welcoming in the invitation of contemplating yeah. and and you know because um you know the the image or whatever it is that you're contemplating or any of these uh experiences that could be considered beautiful i mean they're not going to um like invade you kind of 
Like it's not, they're not the, they're, it's not aggressive in the sense that it's going to go at, go to you and make you look at it or whatever it is. It's like you, the viewer is the one or the receiver, whatever it is, is the one that has to engage and willingly participate. Yeah, the beholder has to be willing to contemplate. Yeah, exactly. So, so then it's like it, you know, a painting or, you know, maybe Christ in the like uh what you said that he's he's uh symbolic res respectfully knocking yeah. um it's just like it's there and you can open the door or not and you yeah. know like that opening of the door con constitutes the participation yeah. that you are willing to provide to that relationship yeah and there is something to be said just by noticing that the door is being knocked on mm. you're participating yes most you definitely know? just just listening just giving it one second you don't have to have a revelation about it yeah you, know, like, you don't have to be like oh, oh, oh. like yeah yeah i'm feeling <laughs> it <everyone. laughs> i have the answer you know it's yeah just, yeah just letting it come in just noticing just having that giving yourself that moment to contemplate and you're you're in it yeah yeah okay well now um what are in your opinion and these are these are extra questions because you deal in these subjects and i like that um what are religion and the divine in your opinion or to you you know as if they're separate they're separate you're saying what's the difference between religion no and no no divine? what what are they um i mean i guess i guess i separated the the term divine because i feel like it you know, it does relate to religion, but it also might not in other occasions. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I just, um, I, I don't know. What, what, what do you? I think religion is the, the human attempt to explain what love is meant to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's so many failures attached to that attempt. And it's ongoing. I mean, yeah. it just goes on from beginning to end. There will always be someone screwing up how to explain that, you yeah. know, we either by terrible example, literally with their mouth, horrible actions, doing the exact opposite that Christ says, like, just like what? There, there's so many examples. So in that way, I would say that's religion. You know, if you want to find a story, there's many. But I think the divine, okay, there's a story that I was told once about a saint. And the saint's name, I think, is Saint Paisios. And this man was, was talking to him, and he was like, Father, what's the difference between human justice and divine justice? Oh, no, he said, what's the difference between a human, per like just a normal person and a saint? Mm -hmm. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. Father, what's the difference between a nor just a regular Joe Schmo and a saint? And the saint said, the difference is human justice and divine justice. So I think there's something in, in this story has to do with what, like locating what is divine for me. Um, so he says, human justice is you're just trying to make something fair. He said, if we were walking upon in a forest and we came upon a peach tree and there was 10 peaches, human justice would be, I'll take five peaches and you get five peaches. Mm -hmm. That's human justice. He says, we have a whole court system to figure that out because we're so terrible at it. We can't, and we can't even do that. Like we have so many fucking issues. We can't even divide anything equally. So he said, divine justice is even harder. It's even harder. It's higher than that. And I don't know how to explain this correctly, but it's something like having to do with like, you want to give all of it. So you see the peaches and you're so filled with love for your brother that you say, oh, these peaches are so delicious. I want you to have all of the peaches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the person's like, no, let's split them. He's like, no, no, I'm not hungry. Please take them. You know, and, and there's like, 
you can't do that kind of thing out of obligation. Oh, I'm supposed right. to. You yeah, yeah, it yeah. has to come from a real like you want to do it. Yeah, yeah. And he said that that is a practice that takes a lifetime to understand where that even comes from and to want to do it so it feels natural. I mean, come on. But that is divine justice. He says a saint will, will participates on that level in life with with love. I don't know. So for me, the divine is beyond our failings, mm -hmm. our selfishness. It, it overwhelms our selfishness. It becomes, and in that way, we kind of um, can escape some small, mm, I don't know how to say that. I don't know if you're escaping your humanity, but it becomes secondary. This, the, the world is kind of like, it does it, it it's there you're participating in it but you're like not thinking about it mm -hmm. it's like the world becomes a symbol the world becomes an icon of heaven mm -hmm. in that scenario mm -hmm. because your your worldly desires and wants and needs they just don't even matter you're thinking about something else there's more that like transcends that stuff <sighs> so i think that's divine and there's a lot of different ways to think about that and talk about that, especially in an aesthetic life, which that man is living, which is a very difficult thing. But I think we're all called to discover what that means in some way in our lifetime, whatever. And we all have different stories, different examples in our lives where we can say, I saw selflessness in this person and they showed me that's what being a human is supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, like grass is green, the sky is blue, and humans are supposed to participate in selfless love. That's like, that's how it's supposed to be. I think that's why Christ came and like, God was like, look, here's Jesus. He's going to show you what you're supposed to look like. This is what humans are supposed to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and grass is green and people do this. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So, so that behavior, um, you, uh, you said it's selfless giving? Yeah, but it's completely irrational. It's so why irrational. Is it irrational. Because why would you do the opposite thing? It's like the opposite thing. That oh, you the want. opposite thing. The opposite, opposite thing is irrational in your opinion? Yeah, I think because it's, because it's um, the selflessness, that kind of wholehearted selflessness, it kind of mm -hmm. enters into kind of like a mystical irrationality. That's the thing. <laughs> okay. And I think artists deal with the irrational all the time. We deal with the abstract. We we take one thing, we turn it into something else, especially with with illusion. Mm. You know, we're taking apart reality and we're putting it back together in this in this wordless way. Um, there's something about that that I think overlaps with what I'm talking about, but who knows? Uh huh. I mean, I. <clears throat> but I mean, I, I, what you're saying sounds, sounds like you know what you're talking about or <clears throat> are on the path at least to figuring it out. I don't know. So, um, okay. <laughs> so then how, in that case, how do religion and the divine come into your work? I mean, I guess you kind of you kind of started, uh, you know, kind of stepping into that earlier. But I, I kind of wanted to go through the other stuff. But I would, uh, if it's okay with you, of course, to now elaborate a bit more about how do religion and the divine come into your work? Okay. Um, so religion is the construct, the human construct that I was raised in. And it contains all the rituals and traditions that I'm familiar with that make me feel like I know who I am. And that comes with being Greek, you know, if you're a Greek American person, you are very different from a Greek person living in Greece. Right. And I can think of 300 reasons why, but one of them is that you have no idea what's going on in Greece really. It's like right. happening parallel to you. And if you went to Greece, they would be like, what? <laughs> You're stuck in the forties. 
this <laughs> you're going to church right now mm-hmm. a lot of greek americans at least that i know they raise their children in the church they have certain traditions that they keep and it's just it, i mean that's it, it's a I think that happens with a lot of different cultures that come to them. Sure. They try to harbor the things, remember the things that they loved about their country and the, th- their, the values that they held dear. And they have the freedom to do that here. And sure. so they do yeah. it to the nth degree. Like we have oh, yeah. Orthodox churches sprinkled all over America. And it, you could, it's like hilarious, honestly. And a lot of people go to church in America that are, that are Greek, you know. But I think in Greece, people don't really go to church. It's, that's not a thing. It's mm-hmm. very like, it's almost like like kind of taboo that you would go. That's from what I understand. It's mm-hmm. like, why would you go? That's mm-hmm. for old people. <laughs> it's not part of the culture in the way it used to be anyway. Um, it's moved on. And I don't know, there's something to be said for that. Um, but the religion that I know taught me how to Greek dance, it taught me. Um, Greek like, dance? Yeah, Greek dancing, like traditional Greek dancing. Nice. Uh-huh. And I would dress up in like costumes every summer and and perform these traditional dances from the villages um, with, with these young children. And I did it all the way up until I was like 20. Nice. And then I, I was like teaching the dances. Mm-hmm. I still love it, you know, and I really feel like I know who I am in some level because of that. So like religion gave me all these things. But I think divine, and divine the divine is like, that's the hard part. That's like, religion is like the boat. It's like the ark, but like faith, real faith, you have to build your own boat. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think the fact that like, I identify as queer and I've, I've suffered greatly for that with my family uh-huh. and they have as well. Um, but I don't think that I would actually be able to participate in my faith in a way that was my own, unless I was like pushed off the arc. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like there's something that that's given me some insight and some, a reason that's mine and not something that I, someone spooned for me. Mm -hmm which for many people is and can be, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I, I think I've been forced to ask a lot of questions about what is the difference between those two things. They don't go together perfectly for everyone all the time. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. So so for, for so in your experience, uh, being like that rejection of your identity on the part of your family, what, uh, helped you find that relationship with your, you know, the religion that you grew up with? It didn't, I mean, yeah, it I mean, does, me is, what is that my, right? Yeah, it showed me what my faith actually is. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh-huh. It like stripped everything away. Yeah. And it was just me. And I'm it was like, just you well, and your, it was just you and your belief. Yeah, it's like, well, what else do I, what do I have? You know, mm-hmm. you can't take that away. <laughs> Okay. So, yeah, and that's kind of where I am with that. But, like, I think religion tries to explain what love is. With Christianity, it's trying to talk about the Trinity. I think we see the Trinity in life a lot. You know, for God to be good, it, God can be one. For God to be two, um, God has to be two for there to be two people um sharing in the same thing Mm -hmm. and then god can be three because it's like the joy that they experience sharing the same thing that's Mm -hmm. the third thing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think that's the divine and i think that's what a drawing or a painting is too i think like making art like the art is a repository of that third thing 
of these two things coming together and this third thing is happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's um that's really I don't know, I think it's uh I wanna say like positive adjectives like great and stuff, but uh, being rejected by your family isn't a nice thing. Uh, but but I guess I, I had an impulse to use positive adjectives because um, I think I just uh, respect and admire, I guess, that, that you didn't make a negative association with your, with your faith because of that experience. Mm. Um, and rather, it reinforced your relationship I mean it's what I understand from what you're saying yeah, uh, it reinforced yeah. your relationship with the faith that you grew up in and I just I just think it's um, I don't know I mean I think the the journey you know the the search which by the way is uh, something is also a thread that has like emerged from the conversations that I've been having on the subject about art, um, as art as a search of something, what, uh, we, I don't know, nobody seems to know yet, but searching for something has come up more than once as part of what art is. Yeah. Um, yeah. and, and I just, Um, uh, I don't, I don't want to sound like, um, uh, like I'm diminishing any suffering that you might've gone through because of that, uh, difficult relationship, but like, w I mean, with, because of these situations, this situation with your family, but like your journey with your faith, um, uh, it's a search. It's yeah. been a search and, you know, it, you are continuing to engage in that search with your work. Yeah, and that way they go really hand in hand. They're perfectly melded. They're designed in some way to go together. They need each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that artists, all artists have some kind of spiritual intuition or relationship with the ineffable in order to make anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think I just am talking about going that step further and being like naming those things and giving certain jargon, certain words, making those things kind of seeing the overlaps with my theology, you know, where, where does that overlap the way that I'm approaching my studio and my practice and the questions and the searches of that it's very similar to the aesthetic life. It, ver it very much is. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I think that we can talk about these things. I like, I'd like to think that, that, that I can talk about Christ without having to paint Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Is that I part of what, I'm sorry, go ahead. I used to think I needed to be an iconographer uh -huh. because I could make art and I thought that's what I was meant to do. And I, I just found it incredibly stifling because there's a real beauty and a craft to the style that comes from that, but you cannot change it. And when you're painting the icon, you have to be praying. You have to live an aesthetic life to be able to even and it, they don't even call it painting. They call it writing, writing. And really, and it's not yours It's God is making it. And you're very conscious of that while you're doing it, kind of remove your ownership of it. And there's no real creative license besides the care that you put into the process and the technique with the egg tempera and, you know, developing your, your line because you want mm. to describe the Virgin Mary with, with grace. So you have to know what grace is. Mm -hmm. you want to describe the Virgin Mary with beauty, you have to understand what divine beauty looks like and feels like inside your own experience of being a person. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like 
it's like requires you to live like an aesthetic life you no know, like fasting and going to church all the time and like having really specific and i think that there is there's something beautiful about that but i just could not do that i was like they are i need to talk about a lot of different things and i don't think i can talk about all of them but i can't mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, there, there's too many things i need to encounter and speak about and deal with and many of them are contradictions and you can't really have contradictions and icons it seems like there's not really space for that uh-huh like what contradictions like there's not even like in an icon the only tension in an icon is in you noticing that that's a window into heaven and you're here and they're there mm -hmm. At least that's how I relate to icons, because icons are like, it's like a window into the heavenly realm. It's like they're pouring out onto you. There's okay. all these gold and whatever. And you have a relationship with these people in there. Like you talk, like the same way you have like a, you'd kiss a picture of someone you love that died. Mm -hmm. You just kiss the picture of this person. You speak to them, you talk mm -hmm. to them all the time. Mm -hmm. And you pray to them, you ask them for help mm -hmm. or whatever, guidance. And just in, just in asking, you have find calm. Anyway, the ten there's not tension in an icon. There isn't? I don't think there is. But you mean within the icon, there's no tension? Like within the painting, in the story of the paint, there's not really tension. Uh, okay, so so then the tension that you're talking about comes from rather the relationship between the human looking at it and, and the people in the window to heaven. Yeah. Because the human isn't there. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense as a contradiction because it's like, obviously, if they're in heaven and you're not there, it means you're not in heaven. So yeah. then that's a, you know, that is a physical yeah. contradiction that they're in heaven and you're not, right? Yeah, it, but then there's even like those icons that show Christ's life, like things that happen, like Christ on the cross, him resurrecting. There's so much, there's tension, I guess, in those images, but it's like the eternal now. It's like, it's not just happening then. Like they aren't just trying to depict it as a factual jesus had this skin tone and he lived in the mediterranean and his mother was this tall like they really try to like be factual about it mm -hmm. like what like I, I grew up thinking about those icons like they show all these rocks and mountains and stuff yeah and i was like i grew up kissing them like what is that and when i went to israel i was like this is israel all of those landscapes that I thought were like cartoon, like I thought someone just made those up. That is literally what it looks like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there. It's very factual. I was like, what the heck? I was like walking around. I felt like I was in an icon, like even nice. the light, the way the yeah, light yeah. looked. Like I was like, what? Anyway, what's the point of this? I'm just saying, I didn't want to do icons. I felt like I couldn't paint about things that felt more human to me and things I wanted to talk about. And I just felt like it was too narrow. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful path, but it was too narrow for me. I wanted to have a room to, you know, fool around with it. So I've had to like, think about what is important to me about making these images. What is it that I even want to talk about? And the thing that's the same is that I do want to talk about my spirituality, but I want to talk about my journey, mm -hmm. my search to that thing that I'll never get the answer to, mm -hmm. but that I know is really good. I know it's good. Just like, I don't know, it's just the way that someone would know that they want to make art, that they yeah, want yeah. to make art. Like, yeah, yeah. they don't know why they're doing it, but they just have to keep doing it. Whether it's a compulsion, I don't know. I don't know. Probably need to edit this. <laughs> That's not. Uh, <laughs> not only do I not don't think so, but I don't know how yet. <laughs> anyway, but um, uh, e either way, for future when I do learn how to edit, the only thing I want to do uh, in the future is just add an, an intro that I'll record separately because otherwise, I, I really don't. Uh, I, I I want the conversation. You know, I just just like today, the conversation to just be like a regular conversation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like just, I guess I'm just saying I'm embarrassed.
Don't. But I find myself not making sense at the moment. So. Are you kidding? I don't know. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I understand why you would feel that way, but uh, I think you made plenty of sense. Um, and uh, another another thing that I enjoy of uh, from when you grace us with the long camp captions on Instagram is that, or you know, just uh, you know, talking in, in, in general on the on on on, on the subject is that um, I, I, I kind of perceive the way that you talk to be kind of like poetic, uh, sort of. It reminds me a little bit of <clears throat> um, a, a different subjects, of course, but a little bit of, of Dan Thompson also, like when he explains and he talks about things in general, I also think he's poetic uh, when he talks. But, um, well, I really enjoyed this conversation and we're nearing, it's been 55 minutes since I started the, the timer. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I think the time went by really quite quickly because it was very enjoyable. So, um, well, uh, I think this is a, a good place for us to start closing it off. And why don't you, uh, Sophia, why don't you uh, please tell our viewers and listeners, I mean, I guess you kind of have gone into it throughout the episode, but... Uh, if you, if there's any, if, is there any project in particular, just, uh, not just art, but, you know, also art, but if you want to talk about music or anything, anything that you're working on lately and, um, and also please, uh, tell everyone where they can find your work. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I'm using Instagram. So my Instagram is S-K-A-Y-A-F-A-S. S -A -A -Y -A -F -A -S. Mm -hmm. um, and I usually use that as like a journal and I post my paintings um, in progress and drawings and sketches and sculptures and everything. Sometimes I put videos of me playing music, um, but I'm just in my studio these days painting, trying to figure out my painting language. That's what I've been doing. Um, I'm not convinced that I have found some anything yet, but I, I have something, but I'm not convinced yet. So. I have been slow to post the paintings, um, but you can see what I've been doing there. That's the most recent stuff. And I also have um, been working on music a lot. Nice. Um, which I, I think is very much like painting as well. Oh, interesting. Um, especially in the way that I don't really know what the song is about until the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I'm like, I have a, an idea of what I was talking about. Oh, it was about this. Then I could put the lyrics. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I've been working on that. I, I'm going to re-release an album soon on Spotify. And the Let's Go Swimming one? Yeah, Apple iTunes. I had a, I remastered it and re-recorded the whole thing with like a real person that like knew what they were doing. Nice. <laughs> and um, they mixed Because it already it. sounded good, by the way. I listened to it and it yeah. already sounded good. Thank you. I did it in my apartment and I didn't do it with like a click track. So nothing is in time. Uh -huh. Maybe you don't, you can't tell, but it's like very obvious to anyone that studies music. So someone, this person, maybe, you know, him Swami, um, but I think do, I think that's how you say his last name. No, I don't know who that is. Anyway, he's really talented and he helped me remaster nice. it. Nice. And all of the music, and all of my drawings, which are really cool, I like the drawings a lot, for this realm, this world I'm building, it's all on my website. Nice. Right so okay. Until it gets re-released on Spotify and iTunes, it's just on my website, and my website is just my name, sophiakayapis.com. Okay. It's like a little music section, and you can see what it is. Yes, I saw that. Like stuff. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for talking with me and like asking me questions that were Honestly, I couldn't have guessed what they might have been or how I might feel while I was answering them, but it was really fun to answer them. Okay, <laughs> good. I'm glad you feel that way. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Sophia, for joining me. Um, thank you for your time and thank you for your words and thoughts. And um, thank you everyone for joining us and feel free to let Sophia and I know what you think of this conversation in the comments section. I also invite you to subscribe 
to my audiovisual channel because I have more of these conversations planned and I invite you to like this video and share it with all your friends and frenemies. Yeah. See you next time. <laughs> Bye.